Hi, everyone. Welcome to our Friday uh, special omics seminar series. This week, we are excited to have Dr. Brent Stockwell from Colombia. And briefly, Dr. Stockwell received his uh, bachelor's degree from Cornell and PhD from Harvard together with Dr. Uh, Professor Stard Schreiber. And he's currently a, a professor at Columbia University with the appointments in Department of Biological Sciences and Department of Chemistry. And he's also a member of the Motor Neuron Center and the Cancer Center at Columbia Medical School. And um, Dr. Stockwell's research involved the use of chemical tools to define cell death mechanisms in order to better understand and treat cancer and neurodegeneration. And prior to joining Columbia, he was an independent fellow at the Whitehead Institute for Biomedical Research. And he has also received multiple prestigious awards, including Pro Bro's Welcome Kussi Award, Beckman Young Investigator Award, and many others. Uh, and with this, I think we'll turn to Dr. Uh, Stockwell, please. Great, thank you so much for the invitation and chance to speak to the community here and, and interact with you. Um, I'm really passionate about spatial omics lately, so uh, it's a great chance to share some of our data. Most of what I'll show you we haven't published. The first part, the biological rationale, we've published that part on ferroptosis, but a lot of the second part as I get into the omics, you'll see is, is, is new things. I always like to mention commercial interests. Uh, not, there's nothing relevant to today's seminar particularly, but um, these are the various consulting and patent filings that we have, um, collaborations, et cetera, with various companies. But again, nothing. I'm not talking about anything relevant to these today. Um, I'm going to present unpublished data, so I ask that you don't share those out on social media. And, but if anyone does want to follow up, uh, feel free to get in touch with me. There's my email, and uh, we could we could chat about anything in more detail. So, in my lab, we've been interested in cell death for a number of years. Cell death is involved in the normal development of multicellular organisms, and then it goes awry in various diseases, um, where you could have either too much or too little cell death, and Ultimately, if we could control cell death, we understand the mechanisms, we could potentially intervene in these diseases and understand these normal physiological roles of cell death. Now, obviously, many people are familiar with apoptosis, and then in the last uh, several years, there's been interest in non-apoptotic cell death and how these non-apoptotic mechanisms might work and whether they're involved in various diseases. And from a therapeutic standpoint, the selective triggering of cell death in various cancers has been a path to breakthrough cancer medicines. So we could think about oncogenic dependencies where you have a mutated oncogene that is driving an addiction, a dependency in certain cancers. And if you can target that like BRAF or BCR ABLE or KRAS now, that creates a potentially useful therapeutic. Uh, there's, there are tumor markers that can be targeted in a selective way, like CD20 on B cells, rituximab and HER2. And then there are immunotherapies that take advantage of the intrinsic tumor selectivity of the immune system to recognize tumor cells and eliminate those cells. So the question is, are there other ways of selectively triggering cell death beyond these kind of three paradigms that have been successful. Particularly, uh, this is important because many cancers do develop resistance to apoptosis. It's one of the hallmarks of cancer in the weinberg hanahan paradigm. And a lot of those resistance mechanisms are specifically about apoptosis. So are there ways to get around these resistance mechanisms or at least to target tumors that are resistant to apoptosis through other types of cell death? So 
as I mentioned, I, I'm going to give you a little background on the biological rationale and, and problem that we're working on, and then talk about how spatial omics comes to play in this. So um, the, the biological interest came from an observation when I was a fellow at the Whitehead Institute uh, in 2001, we did a screen for compounds that could selectively kill RAS mutant cancer cells. And the best compound we found was this new molecule that uh, we named Erastin, eradicator of RAS transformed cells. And it, it had that selective activity, but the interesting thing was that it acted through a non-apoptotic mechanism. Here's a control compound that induces DNA damage and apoptosis and Erastin. We looked at many assays and markers and it clearly activated some other kind of cell death mechanism. And so to make a long story short, we define this as a new type of cell death regulated by different regulators and apoptosis. We termed it ferroptosis because of the key role of iron. And ultimately, ferroptosis is a cell death driven by the peroxidation, a type of oxidation, of certain lipids, phospholipids that have polyunsaturated fatty acyl tails. So in order to get ferroptosis, you need three things. You need these substrates, the phospholipids with the PUFA tails. Those are the chemical substrates of the peroxidation chemistry. You need a pool of redox active iron that drives the peroxidation, and that can be mediated by various enzymes or in some cases non-enzymatic. And then you need, most importantly, a failure in the repair system that normally is eliminating these lethal peroxide, lipid peroxides. And, and if you get all of those, you can get this death by lipid peroxidation, this death by ferroptosis. So we, we became convinced this could be more generally interesting when Adam Walpaw, a graduate student in my lab, an MD PhD student, did a large scale screen of, of more than 100,000 compounds to find ones that induced unusual types of cell death. And he was able to cluster these based on their mechanism, having to do with how they were modulated by different genetic or chemical treatments. And to make, again, a long story short, he found there were a lot of compounds that did cause a largely necrotic death. There were a bunch of known compounds that caused mostly apoptosis. And then there was this compound, Erastin, and then another one, and then a few more we found over the years that induced this new type of regulated cell death that's driven by iron, aka ferroptosis, as I just described it to you. So it seemed to be uh, clearly distinct from classic necrosis and apoptosis. Um, and so we verified that, and then we first published this in 2012 with all the criteria for ferroptosis and, and coined the term. Um, and then, and since then, many people have started looking and, and finding roles for ferroptosis in various processes. The interesting thing about ferroptosis is that many of the components of what we now consider ferroptosis were discovered much earlier in the 60s, 70s, 80s, things like lipid peroxidation, a key role of cysteine and cysteine in controlling cell death and cell viability, this key lipid repair enzyme GPX4 and so forth, but they hadn't been put together into this framework of a specific non-apoptotic cell death pathway. By putting that framework together, we can now link all of these different fields and different observations into a cohesive paradigm. And I think that's one of the reasons the field has become so dynamic uh, in the last few years as you start to see these, these unappreciated links between different fields. Uh, just to mention, ferroptosis pathway components are found in various species. So we, a few of us wrote this review a couple of years ago where we we look to see are the components of ferroptosis or evidence of ferroptosis found in various species throughout evolution. And we do see in humans, mice, mammals generally, and also in plants, direct evidence for ferroptosis. In, in other species like fish and birds and yeast, we see all the components are there. So there's the potential, but it, it hadn't been, hasn't been directly observed. 
convincingly so. And then in single-celled organisms, uh, bacteria and archaea, there's no direct evidence, and in particular, there's a lack of polyunsaturated fatty acids, which are one of the key substrates. So under normal conditions, you probably wouldn't see ferroptosis in those species. So there's been, uh, as I said, a, a lot of work from us and from others looking at the potential roles of ferroptosis in many different um, disease and other biological processes. We can sort of group them into degenerative diseases, roles in tumor suppression, various cancers, and then some tissue engineering, agricultural, climate change applications that are emerging as well. So one of the first questions we asked was, what triggers ferroptosis? How does this process get started? And actually, the, that first compound we found, erastin, was the first trigger and illuminated that there's a cell surface antiporter called System XC, which normally imports cysteine, but in the form of its oxidized disulfide um, form, cysteine, into cells. And then that cysteine gets reduced to cysteine. So this import of cysteine is inhibited by erastin. And then we made a more optimized version of erastin that we called imidazole ketone erastin, or IKE, that can be used in animal studies. And we also discovered that one of the few known drugs that could maybe, well, one of the very few known drugs that could trigger ferroptosis was a multi-targeted kinase inhibitor, serafinib, that could also inhibit system XC, but indirectly as a result probably of inhibiting a kinase leading to a, a change in phosphorylation of system XC. So the bottom line is that these are different ways of blocking cysteine import into cells that use this uptake mechanism. And then as a result of depleting cysteine, these cells don't have enough glutathione to power this lipid repair process that glutathione peroxidase 4, this key enzyme I mentioned briefly before, um, undertakes to eliminate these phospholipid PUFA peroxides. So if you deplete cysteine, you, you starve these cells of cysteine, then you in, inhibit this repair and you get this overwhelming accumulation of lipid peroxides. And that's what ultimately kills these cells. So as I mentioned, um, IKE we felt would be a great pro because it is very selective for inducing ferroptosis, unlike serafinib. Serafinib is, is used clinically, of course, it's FDA approved for certain liver cancers and renal cancers, but it has other mechanisms and some other cell killing mechanisms at higher concentrations, whereas IKE only induces ferroptosis. So this could allow us to selectively probe the therapeutic benefit of triggering ferroptosis. And we could see in various models, we looked at a, a tumor slowing effect um, in the lymphoma model, for example, in the xenograft study, we can see when we dose with IKE, we get a slowing of tumor growth, not a complete inhibition on its own in this model. Uh, but if we combine with radiation, which we showed uh, last year, can also induce ferroptosis as a result of the glutathione depletion induced by ionizing radiation, then the combination could give us a complete uh, cessation of tumor growth and even some regression. So in the right setting, a, a single agent like IKE might be able to, to uh, regress tumors even beyond just, just inhibiting tumor growth. But nonetheless, we've been kind of intrigued with the question of, can we design a better ferroptosis inducer by understanding more about how IKE works, how ferroptosis works in the, in the tissue context? which cells are responding, where is the drug going, and is that really optimized for a therapeutic for this type of cancer? And that's where we turn to mass spectrometry imaging. This was um, probably four or five years ago. I started getting interested in this technology and thought this could be a key way to understand and answer some of these really what had been intractable questions. You know, where in a tissue does a compound accumulate? you dose with a drug. 
what are the pharmacodynamic effects of a drug in different cell types? Do all the cells respond equally or are there different responses in different cell types? And does that tell us about the mechanism of action of the drug? What about metabolites of the drug? What metabolites are produced and where do they go and what do they do? And then of all these effects, which ones correlate with efficacy and which ones with toxicity? With that information, we should be able to design safer and more effective drugs. So we began uh, setting up multimodal mass spectrometry imaging, uh, incorporating, we do a, a lot of desorption ionization, DESI imaging, and we've done a bit of MALDI, although it, it just turns out for a lot of the compounds we're interested in, they're easier to detect by DESI for whatever reason. Um, we've done some SIMS with Hua Tan and Nick Winograd at Penn State. They're one of the world's experts in off SIMS imaging, and we've been working with them on a hub map project, and then also uh, some imaging mass cytometry to look at different cell types. Um, we've been trying to layer on top of that now spatial transcriptomics to see mRNA expression in different cell types. If you didn't see that, that was method of the year last year, so that was that was pretty exciting uh, for the field, I think. Okay, so our thought was hepatocellular carcinoma is a great model because sorafenib, as I mentioned, is one of the only drugs that's known that could induce ferroptosis, and it, it is clinically used to treat hepatocellular carcinoma. A little bit renal cancers, but mainly hepatocellular carcinoma, and that is a major unmet medical need. And so it might be part of the efficacy of sorafenib is due to this ability to induce ferroptosis. That's a hypothesis. So hepatocellular carcinoma is the sixth most common cancer worldwide, and it has a dismal prognosis. Uh, Sorofenib and then now lenvotinib was approved recently as a, another treatment, primary treatment for hepatocellular carcinoma, but they do have a modest lifespan uh, benefit, we have to acknowledge. So much better therapies are, are definitely needed. And these are multi-targeted kinase inhibitors uh, that conventionally are thought to act through VEGF and, and PDGF. But if we could make other kinase inhibitors or other therapies that have a better efficacy and less toxicity, sorafenib in particular has a, a, a lot of adverse uh, effects, then that would be quite beneficial. So how can we do this? So just to show you, sorafenib can inhibit system XC. So again, this is, we think, indirect based on the downstream effect of inhibiting kinase, but it is very rapid. So this is one way we can measure this activity. We, we look at glutamate release. System XC normally imports cysteine and it exports glutamate in a one-to-one -one ratio. So if we're inhibiting glutamate release, we're inhibiting system XC, and we can see in this different cell lines shown here in this figure, arastin or sorafenib can both inhibit glutamate release. This is within a few minutes um, in all these cell lines, or we can look at glutathione depletion. So that's a downstream consequence of inhibiting cysteine uptake. We see that glutathione depletion with sorafenib, or uh, if we measure lipid peroxidation with this fluorescent dye, but dpc 11 we see that when we treat with sorafenib, we get an increase in that fluorescence indicative of lipid peroxidation. So it, it induces all the hallmarks of ferroptosis, at least in these cell models. We looked in a number of different cell lines. Presha Raj Bhandari in my lab looked at this and found that, yes, in, in general, we see in many different cell lines, we can get cell killing with sorafenib that's inhibited by this ferroptosis inhibitor, ferrostatin, which we commonly use as a test for ferroptosis versus other types of cell death. Um, lenvotinib, interestingly, we recently discovered, can also induce ferroptosis, which was intriguing because it is, as I said, the only other therapy, it's a kinase inhibitor for uh, HCC, hepatocellular carcinoma. And so 
if the hypothesis is that there's something about the ferroptosis activity that is useful for serafinib and HCC, we the fact that we also see that activity with lenvotinib reinforces that hypothesis. So here we see uh, again with C11 bodibi just to show you one assay that lipid peroxidation marker we get that induced with lenvotinib and that's blocked by ferrostatin or with an iron chelator CFO which is another way to inhibit ferroptosis. So we then established a, a genetic liver cancer mouse model in collaboration with Robert Schwabe at Columbia uh, to, to have an orthotopic model that we could use to test these compounds and do the imaging of their localization and, and effects. Uh, we wanted an immunocompetent model, obviously, because we want to look at immune cells and so we didn't want to use a cell xenograph, we wanted to use more of a genetic model where we could deliver these, these oncogenes or loss of tumor suppressors and then get liver tumors and then evaluate the effect. So this is an NRAS and, and P19 ARF driven model, um, which is we deliver these plasmids by hydrodynamic tail vein injection, they go to the liver, induce these liver tumors, and then we can evaluate the treatment of serafinib or IKE or lenvotinib. So we put it, we established a, a DESI imaging workflow desorption ionization mass spectrometry imaging uh, with a water synapse G2SI that we acquired uh, recently. And in this case, we're basically coming in with an electrospray ionization on the surface and then it ionizes various metabolites and lipids and, and drug compounds, small molecules on the surface of the sample. And then we capture those and it's done pixel by pixel. So we get that uh, image map of each ion after kind of data processing. So here's uh, an example where this can be done quite well. So we're now looking on on, in the rows of the different treatments of the mice. So we administered either just vehicle or IKE, that's the cure for apoptosis inducer, or serafinib or lenvotinib. And then we detected, obviously we acquired the full mass spectrum, but here we're just pulling out the relevant ions to show you what we detected. So in this case, we detected on the first panel IKE, so that's the mass of IKE. And you can see IKE, and this is, this is now a section of the liver where it includes both normal and tumor in that section. And so you can see with IKE treatment, we get IKE detected in, in various regions, not, not completely homogeneous, but is detectable in different regions within the liver. Whereas obviously when we treat with serafinib or lenvotinib or vehicle, we don't see IKE. And then similarly, if we dose the mice with serafinib, and these are different dose levels, we can detect serafinib in the tissue as expected and the same for lenvotinib. So the good news is we have the system working and we can confirm the, that we can detect each of these species. And as I mentioned, although a lot of people use MALDI, um, we just found that these, these compounds were easier to detect by DESI than by MALDI. Okay, so one of the, now obviously the big questions are the ones I laid out in the beginning, but there are some little technical details which are um, important to think about and address. So the, one of the questions is, can we quantitate exactly how much compound is present in each region of the tissue. And so in order to do that, we need to, to know, we need to have a good standard to normalize to. And we need to know that the ionization efficiency from different parts of the tissue is similar. Or if it's different, we need to know how different it is. So there was this um, Publication Bioanalysis 2019, which, which uh, summarized this methodology for, for establishing a standard curve in the relevant kind of 
material, matrix, biomaterial, tissue that you're interested in. So the idea was you take a series of tissue homogenates and you spike with your compound of interest, you layer those together, freeze it, section it, and then you image it. And now you should be able to see in this normal kind of tissue matrix that's like the tissue of interest that you're eventually going to be imaging, how the increasing amount of the compound correlates with the increasing detectability. And you get a standard curve. And then you can know, you know how much you put in. So you know, based on the response, how much is in that tissue in principle. Um, and so, and another another um, strategy is is spray an isotopically labeled compound onto the surface, and then detect normalize the the compound that we're interested in to that isotopically labeled compound because that should be even across the surface. And if it to the extent it varies, that tells you how the ionization of that sample of that compound varies in different regions of the tissue. So we did this um, with the three compounds, and this just shows you an example where we have the liver homogenate, and then we have increasing concentrations, and then we can see, indeed, in, in a normal liver or tumor, we can get, um, there is some difference in the, the ionization efficiency, even in the homogenate. Uh, in liver versus normal. So that's an important distinction to be able to make and then control for. Um, and then you can make the standard curve and then be able to calculate how much you're actually detecting. Um, and so here's an example where that was important. So and with all the compounds, this is an example with serafinib, but if we normalize, uh, the red region is the tumor region in the liver. And so you can see the amount of uh, this is looking at a total ion intensity, normal amount of serafinib normalized to total ion intensity. And so if you compare the amount in the tumor versus the normal, the right and the left in each of these panels, it looks like in some cases there's more in the tumor, but it turns out if you correct for the ionization efficiency with the isotopically labeled compound in the two regions, then actually there's less in the tumor. And so that that's really just a difference in the ionization efficiency from the tumor versus the normal. So we've realized that's that's an important caveat that you have to correct for with these kind of controls. So Presha's worked all this out and, and she's been spearheading this effort. And so it's more of a progress report. I mean basically we've been able to set up this this system and treat with these different uh, three different agents, and then start processing the data. And, and one of the interesting things we see is that you can segment the tumor tissue into discrete regions. In other words, there's different lipid and metabolite concentrations in different regions throughout the tumor of both the untreated and then the treated. And the way you can segment those that tumor after treatment is different in the way you would segment it in the untreated. So in other words, the treatment is changing the composition in different regions of the tumor in a way that's different from how that tumor exists in the basal state. So there's a lot of heterogeneity in the tumor. And I think the basic hypothesis that knowing where each compound goes and what effects it exerts is justified in that sense that we're going to learn a lot about the differential effects and that the tumor is not just a homogeneous kind of substrate that all responds the same. We don't have any specific um, conclusions yet from that, but it, it suggests that it warrants um, this kind of investigation. And we also do see that you, you can identify ions that discriminate between the control, the vehicle treated, and the different drug treatments, compound treatments um, in different regions of the tumor. So these are some different phospholipids, the lipids that change in abundance in different regions of the tumor in response to specific compounds. So in other words, there are pharmacodynamic effects that are specific to different regions of the tumor. And again, that's part of the hypothesis that 
that would tell you about what that the compound is doing and, and the differential effects in different cell types or different um, tumor regions. So we think all that is going to be very interesting and there's still a lot to dig into in terms of what the, what the mechanism of those differences would be and then how we can exploit that information. Um, now, so that's kind of where we are with that project. I just wanted to mention a few other uh, things that we're working on related to imaging. So we've been working on improving the spatial resolution of DESI. So with MALDI, you can have generally higher spatial resolution. We've been collaborating with Waters Corp and trying to, to bring that down. So there's some kind of technical uh, fidgeting and some hardware improvements that uh, they're, they're working on and we're testing with them that can improve the resolution. We think from like 50 micrometer resolution, perhaps to like 20 micrometer resolution. And that in some cases gets close to a single cell resolution, which in my mind is ultimately the goal because you wanna be able to see what's happening in individual cell types, different cell types and how that varies. So when we get to that single cell resolution, that's kind of the, the magic point where you start to learn a lot of interesting things. Um, and I wanna show you one last interesting um, application of mass spec imaging related to ferroptosis. So we, we had done a screen with Camier Hadian and Joel Schick on looking for ways to suppress ferroptosis. This was a CRISPR activation screen where genes that are now overexpressed would suppress ferroptosis. And this we published last year, but basically we found the top gene was GCH1, which is a rate limiting enzyme for making tetrahydrobiopterin, CH4. Um, and we worked out that mechanism and, and that's all in the paper uh, that basically this pathway was a, a new way to suppress Ferroptosis independent of GPX4. However, the interesting point for today is that normally what we had seen is that ferroptosis inhibitors mostly block all or the majority of lipid oxidation events that are occurring during ferroptosis. So it's like an all or nothing. So here's an example where uh, if we treat with IKE and we look at a bunch of phospholipids that get depleted. If we treat with ferrostatin, that compound I mentioned, basically we reverse all of these. And the way we always thought of inhibiting ferroptosis is you're either eliminating the iron or you're blocking the peroxidation propagation. And so everything is blocked and the cells are protected because there's no more lipid peroxidation. So that makes sense as a, as a basal model. However, we had this very interesting observation with GCH1, which was that GCH1 overexpression, and again, that makes this metabolite BH4, it could perfectly protect the cells from dying, but it did not prevent most lipid oxidation events in the cells, even though they were protected. So you're getting plenty of lipid peroxidation. It's just not killing the cells. Um, and so actually, if you look, just IKE treatment, there's a lot of changes on the left panel, overexpressing GCH1, there's still most of those things are still happening. So in other words, a lot of the lipid peroxidation that we were normally seeing is not actually needed for the killing. There's some subset of lipid peroxidation that's actually driving the death. And so when you dig in and say, well, which lipid peroxidation events are actually correlated with the death, meaning like this one, it's, you see it's depleted normally with IKE because it's getting peroxidized, it's disappearing. But then if we overexpress GCH1, it's protected and it's not oxidized. So that is a lipid peroxidation event that's correlated with the death. And it turns out there's a very small number of these that fit this category. And these were all phospholipids that have two PUFA tails. Most phospholipids have one PUFA tail. This, these phospholipids have two PUFA tails. 
and they're the ones that are most closely correlated with the depth. So if you're not that familiar with phospholipid biochemistry, let me just refresh your memory. So phospholipids are built on the glycerol backbone, and they have a, a head group of phosphate and then it's like a phosphatidylcholine or phosphatidyl inositol up here, different head groups. And then the most common situation for phospholipids is you have a saturated fatty acid in the what's called the SN1 position. And then in the SN2 position, you either have saturated, monounsaturated, or polyunsaturated fatty acid. And those are the majority of phospholipids. But it turns out there's this minor subclass, which is not very well studied at all, it turns out, where you have two PUFA lipids, fatty acids, two PUFA uh, fatty acyl tails on both positions. And those are the ones that are particularly important, it seems, for ferroptosis. I mean, we could see that here, that if you, if you treat these cells with the phospholipid with the two PUFA tails, this is a PC with two PUFA tails, you see the killing that's protected by GCH1. But if you treat with a phospholipid with one PUFA tail, you don't see the killing and no change with GCH1. So it, it, again, it's, it's the two PUFA tails that's actually important for the killing for ferroptosis. So that suggested that there's something about these phospholipids with PUFA, but PU, two PUFA tails that may drive cross-linking or membrane reorganization in a way that actually causes the death. And that those are the ones we should really be focusing on for ferroptosis. Now, then we ask, well, are these ever seen normally? And would these tell us where ferroptosis might be important in normal circumstances? How common are these? So again, we turn to mass spec imaging, and this is a different example of where this can be informative. What is the functional role of a particular lipid? In this case, we have phospholipids with two PUFA tails. We have this question, where do they occur? What are they potentially involved in physiologically or pathologically? So if we look at a lot of phospholipids, we see like the normal type with one saturated and an unsaturated tail. Um, they're just pretty much throughout the brain. This is mouse brain. You see them everywhere. This imaging was done by Farushta Zankarimi, and she was in my lab as a postdoc. Uh, and, but when we look for the two PUFA-tailed phospholipids, we do see a few of them. We can detect them. And interestingly, some of them, like this uh, PG, have very specific regional distribution, in this case, localized to the cerebellum. So if we want to generate a hypothesis from this, it would be that maybe there's some role for ferroptosis in the cerebellum, at least in mice, because they are particularly competent to undergo ferroptosis based on the presence of this phospholipid with the two PUFA tails. So, and then the last thing we're doing with uh, spatial omics is the HubMap project I mentioned at the beginning, uh, where there we're focused on normal liver, mostly human, a little bit of mouse, and trying to integrate different imaging modes to build up a, a map, a single cell resolution map of normal liver for that hub map. That's an NIH-wide uh, project to map the body, the human body at single cell resolution, and it's focused on normal human as the, the major emphasis. Um, so here we're taking liver and we're sectioning it, um, and then we're doing normal H&E staining and some LCMS to see what's there in bulk but then some spatial transcriptomics and then largely DESI imaging to see at medium resolution what's there in terms of metabolites, lipids um, in different regions of the tissue and then pick regions of interest and zero in with the technology that uh, Hua Tan and Nick Winograd have developed. Uh, we can use Toff Sims imaging down to one micrometer or better spatial resolution. So there we can easily see single cells and now see the, the difference in abundance in different lipids and metabolites or drug treatments in individual cells. So integrating all the data and, and doing some 3D reconstructions and all of that is, is ongoing, but um, we're, we're excited to try to contribute 
the hub map by bringing these technologies to, to the study of the liver. So to summarize, um, we found that DESI imaging can reveal the distribution of small molecules in tumor tissue, particularly in liver and liver tumors, and that we can find specific lipids and metabolites as pharmacodynamic markers in different tissue regions. Correcting for these matrix effects is, is critical to get good quantitative information. And that I think ultimately the multimodal and 3D reconstructions will provide a really rich data set um, that'll give us a unique opportunity to design safer and more effective therapies for things like hepatocellular cancer. And then I'll just thank again, members of the lab. A lot of this, as I said, was spearheaded by Prussia who's a postdoc in the lab, who's been uh, doing all the mastic imaging. She's on the right, the rightmost side here. And um, these are the different funding organizations that have supported this. And the last thing I wanna mention, if you're interested in ferroptosis, we are organizing the second international ferroptosis meeting, was gonna be last year, and now it's pushed off to next year, but it's at the Cold Spring Harbor Asia Conference we hope to do it in person. Of course, you never know, but hopefully one day back in person. Um, and if you wanna learn more about the field, then this would be a, a great way to, to meet the people involved and hear the latest. So I'll stop there and I'm happy to take any questions. Thank you, Dr. Stockwell for this uh, great presentation. So if you have any questions, please feel free to unmute and ask. Or you can, the sun here, I think, has a question. Oh, it's a, it's clapping or a question? <laughs> I think it's clapping. Oh, uh, just, it was impressed with the talk. So not <laughs> a question, I was really impressed. Thank very you. good, amazing. Thank you very much, I appreciate yeah. that. This is a new area for us. It's actually the first time I've ever spoken about this. So. You are the guinea pigs for my presentation. <laughs> well, it was very clear. Very nice. Excellent. Yeah, I think ferroptosis is a super interesting. I was um, kind of uh, brought into a, one of the proposals my my colleagues trying to write, uh, but uh, that, that's related to ferroptosis, but I didn't understand at all. So this time I finally, I got a <laughs> thanks. <laughs> It's a very educational oh, okay. talk as well. Um, so I have a question sort of kind of on a high level, if you try to kind of design um, the, the cancer drug, for example, based on this pathway of aeroptosis. Uh, so what, 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 what do you think? So if, so if the, the benefit is kind of, can be more cancer cell specific or you have some strategy to make that kind of tumor cell specific and minimize the toxicity or uh, compared to other mechanisms to treat cancer cells? Yes, yes, uh, it's a great question. And mm -hmm. I kind of glossed over that in my enthusiasm to get to the uh. omic, spatial omics. Um, yeah, so actually the, the system XC is ideal in that regard because mm -hmm. a lot of tumors upregulate system XC and then become dependent on that way of getting their cysteine. There are other ways to get cysteine, but that one becomes predominant in many, you know, not all, but a number of different cancers. And it's system XC is not needed in normal tissues. So in mice, for example, if you knock out one of the two genes that encode system XC, SLC7A11, the mice are basically fine. So it suggests that it's not used in normal tissue and normal physiology, but then becomes a, a dependency. So it has that potential, like I said in the first couple of slides, to be one of these very tumor selective kind of mm -hmm. dependencies. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so when we often look at a kind of transcriptal analysis, like a, uh, a oxidative phosphorylation showed up <laughs> in a pathway analysis, uh, also in the immune cells, do, do you happen to know any kind of immune cells also kind of specifically utilize this pathway uh, to regular immune function as well? Well, there is some work on that. Um, we didn't do that, but uh, Wei Ping Zhao's lab in Michigan and 
Um, there's a paper from Pfizer as well. In the last mm -hmm. couple of years, there were two or three papers showing that uh, CD8 T cells release in, in response to either immune checkpoint blockade or other kinds of activation signals, they release interferon gamma. And that obviously interferon gamma does a number of things, but one of the things it does is it downregulates SOC7A11 in the tumor cell target and induces ferroptosis. So it's not that the immune cell is itself under, you know, using ferroptosis internally, but it's it's activating ferroptosis as a tumor suppression in mechanism. target cells. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah, exactly. Okay, exciting. And one quick question as we wait for other questions here from here for the last part, right, the HubNet part. So when you talk about three D, right, and multimodel, so what do you envision? Would you like to get a you know, multiple serial sections and imaged? Or is there any other alternative way? Or what would you suggest? I'm curious about your vision in general. Yeah, yeah, they're, they're not, we can't do the multimodal on the same section. So the, the way we're envisioning it is we do serial sections and then each section goes off to a different mode. And then we reconstruct those sections. And then if we keep doing that, we get the 3D, right, where we then start to have build up a larger volume. And the real problem you're highlighting, I think, is how do you register the sections? Yeah. That's one. And the second one is biology. Right? Biology in terms of Most variability? The, the tissue across the 3D, right? Yeah, yeah. So for, well, for the mark, so if you had a marker in every section and you could align them, then the heterogeneity, these are pretty thin, like five to 10 micron sections. So I think the heterogeneity is small enough from section to section that you can reconstruct, you know, with some inference what's actually there biologically. But I, I think the key is the, the registration. And so we've been thinking about that and talking to various groups and it turns, you know, it's sort of a general problem with these projects and, and liver turns out to be particularly tough because there's not a lot of morphology to do that registration with the way there is in the brain or the kidney is, you know, has a lot of structure mm -hmm. that's a lot easier. So we're thinking um, one is well, the total ion map is not bad for registering and getting like a, a good view of morphology. And then some one group, the group at Vanderbilt we've been talking to has been doing um, autofluorescence of every section and then aligning the autofluorescence images. So those are two ideas. The, the other one that'd be more extreme is you actually mark the sections in some way with posts or something that, that's a physical mark so those are the different options, I think, and we're trying to sort out the best one. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I, I was about to ask that question as well. So can you can I do um, can I IHC or immunofluorescence standing uh, before you do your mass back your DC, and uh, and and then there you can do pretty good uh, cell segmentation and register multiple sections together. Yeah. So. The, the autofluorescence idea is that, that it'll be the same modality then for every section, because every section would get an autofluorescence scan before you mm -hmm. image it. And so that's all the same modality, and it's just the variation from section to section you have to account for. And then, um, and there's enough intrinsic autofluorescence. You're not, so there's no marker, you're not like staining the tissue mm -hmm. with anything, it's just the intrinsic autofluorescence of the tissue. So that's also technically easy to do. Um, so I think that's our that's our default assumption now that that will okay. work, and so that's basically what we're trying first. Okay. Well, yeah, but so my, my question is whether or not that's compatible, uh, whether or not your mass back imaging is compatible with uh, immunofluorescence than like antibody immunofluorescence than tissue oh. sample. Right. To do immunofluorescence, no, that's. Um, mm -hmm. Yeah, I'd have to think about that. I mean, gener generally, we're doing fresh frozen for the mass spec imaging, and then you often would do fixed, you know, 
for fixed permanualized or something. I, I think mm -hmm. we've experimented with a little bit of immunostaining on fresh frozen and it can be more complicated. So mm -hmm. yeah, it's, I, we're actually, that is one of the issues that the team has been talking about. And I can't remember what we've decided <laughs> at the moment, but I, I know mm -hmm. it's an active conversation. Okay, yeah, since we are both in a hot map, I'd like to kind of brainstorm a little bit further, see yeah. how we can work together. We can follow up on that and I'll, I'll loop in the lab members and, and the mm -hmm. collaborators and we can see where we are with that. That's a great question. Mm -hmm. But I think one also question is that, can you do the same slide, right? Let's say the HME labels, will they interfere with your mess spec? Yeah, yeah, we'd have to do, we always plan on doing a different section for that. We mm -hmm. can't use the same section. Um, there might be some way around that eventually, but at the moment, worth imagining that's a different section for each modality. And then did I also see IMC at the bottom? Is it the one that we know, the MESPIC version of imaging? Yeah, so those are the metal tagged antibodies. Mm -hmm. So that's um, that's something that Hua Tian, uh, our collaborator, and Nick Winograd have worked out. The only question is getting the right antibodies for liver. So that's something mm -hmm. we're, we're piloting now and trying to QC all different antibodies, but basically, yeah, they're metal tagged antibodies, and then you can use those to identify different cell types based on cell type markers. Mm -hmm. Cool, very exciting. And any other questions from the attendees? Let me see, chat is okay. So if not, I think then it's almost three o'clock. Maybe we should wrap up and let's thank the speaker again. Thank you, Dr. Stockwell. And let's, it's the clapping time. <laughs> and I appreciated this fantastic talk. So next week, we will be continuing with uh, Dr. Kai Tan from Children's Hospital of Philadelphia. Uh, also, he's gonna talk about developmental mapping of heart and bone tissues. And with this, I think thank you again for your participation. And we look forward to see you guys next week. Thanks, yeah. everyone. It's great to Thank participate. You. Thank you, everyone. Have a good weekend. Bye-bye.